Welcome back. I am John P. Today we are going to be talking about four watch brands that drop in value immediately after you purchase them at retail. I did a video a few years ago where I talked about five watch brands that drop in value very quickly, much like the brands I'm going to be sharing with you today. But interestingly enough, some of those brands have kind of changed along with the market, right? In the last couple of years, we've seen such a growth in not only the amount of watch collectors, but also the types of watches that watch collectors have been purchasing have been going through different shifts and some brands have actually been growing quite a lot since the decreased perception of their value in the video that I did. So make sure to check out that video link in the description below. But today, these four brands in the end of the year 2021, going into 2022, these brands, for the reasons I'm gonna share with you, have just not managed yet to build up their brand enough to really capture the attention of watch buyers, enthusiasts, and collectors to the level that would keep their prices trading out in the secondhand market a little bit closer to the retail price points. Now, I think it's very interesting, but all of these brands that I'm sharing with you are at least trying something. So I'm very excited moving into the future to see what comes out of these brands because there is a template and there are things that they can copy from other brands that have done pretty well for themselves the last few years. And I think some of these brands I'm gonna share with you are probably going to pull it off, but who knows, time will tell. On the wrist today, I have a Seiko Rowing Blazers limited um, collaboration production piece, the Rally Diver. I love this watch. Rowing Blazers is kind of a, a preppy streetwear kind of brand, and they produce very cool blazers, go figure, um, that are for or for people that wear them in the rowing ceremonies. There's a book as well written by Jack Carlson. It's a whole very cool collaboration and lifestyle thing. Check them out, Rowing Blazers. And also, this is not a Star Trek uh, thing here that I'm wearing. This is actually just the pattern. I know there were many people last time I wore this, I said, oh, you must love Star Trek. I actually was uh, at an IWJG show years ago with Federico, Federico Talks Watches. It's a watch show where watch dealers go and they meet up. And interestingly enough, I didn't pack for the cold weather. It was in New York City. I'm down here in Florida in Palm Beach. And so I needed uh, you know, a sweatshirt like this uh, or a sweater very quickly. And this is what was available at the store that was by where we were at. So I picked it up. Uh, but I thought I'd comment on that because there were a lot of people surprisingly that sent me messages about that. But nonetheless, let's jump right into it. Right into it, we have Parmigiani Fleurier, the first brand that drops very substantially in terms of value right after you purchase it at retail. Now, I know that those that are in charge of Parmigiani Fleurier watch these videos. They watch my videos, they watch Federico Talks Watches videos. They're out there and they are actively trying to captivate the minds and the hearts of watch collectors. I know this. I really love the brand Parmigiani Fleurier. I think for about a year, I wore the Parmigiani Fleurier Calpa that was on the Hermes strap. I loved it a whole lot. I love the voucher movements that they put in there. They were nicely, more than adequately decorated, but at the end of the day, I have to consider that I did pay a very steep discount for the watch, which added a lot of the value to the watch, in my opinion. Parmigiani Fleurier makes really great watches that are technically all, for the most part, in-house. Sure, there's some parts probably coming from out-of-house, depends on the model, but nonetheless, they make very high grade, a very fine, true, horological, focused watches, and I really like them for that. That being said, the retail prices are higher than the desirability. And that's why sometimes you see the Parmigiani Fleurier watches trading at, dare I say, 20% of the retail price sometimes. It depends on the model. But Parmigiani Fleurier has recently come out with that integrated kind of sports watch, the, the Genta esque design that everyone is producing. Let's say the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak alternative, for example. And they produce this watch with the blue dial and they're really trying to captivate the younger collectors which are starting to build and make up a really great portion of watch buyers out there. You can see it on their website, check it out, Parmigiani Fleurier. Today, currently, I'd recommend trying to get a great deal on one, but if you love the watches, I won't stop you uh, because they do make a really great watch at the end of the day. So Parmigiani Fleurier drops value quickly, but things can be changing because I know they're trying very hard to uh, build up brand recognition. Next is a brand 
that I think has gone through some periods of confusion, but not on their end. They've stayed pretty true to what they want to offer, but maybe from the perspective of the watch collectors, this is going to be Braemont. Now, I can't say anything negatively, once again, about the quality of the Braemont watches. After all, this is a list, a short list of nice watch brands that I think do a decent job with, or better with the production of their watches, but maybe not quite hit the nail on the head or chose a broad enough target market segment to be able to sell watches at volume. This is gonna be Braemont. Now, Braemont had their dive watch uh, piece that came out of the Supermarine. It was one of the earliest pieces that they did offer, and I really liked it. I liked how it looked. I thought it was kind of cool and trendy and modern. And other people did when it came out as well. And I remember seeing them trading on the forums and they would go pretty quickly. Now, when we have micro brands, Braemont, in my opinion, was one of the earliest micro brands. I would maybe even consider them that with the way that they, they act sometimes in public, but I don't know the production volume. I don't know that's, that it's actually advertised. So it's difficult to consider them a micro brand, but I think they probably should act like a micro brand and pivot and adapt and offer watch collectors a little bit more of what they're looking for. And the thing with Braemont is they have, they tell this story of, you know, the, the true, you know, heritage ingrained in the watches of, of, you know, British history ingrained in the Swiss watches, something along those lines. And they had a partnership with Jaguar. I thought the watches were very cool looking, but they didn't sell either. Those were gray marketed and sold, um, dare I say at pennies on the dollar, not quite, but you get the idea. And, I, that being said, on the flip side, I think Braemont makes a very quality watch. And I think if you can get a great deal on one of their watches, you can't go wrong if you like the design. Just don't expect to buy a Braemont watch today at retail price and expect it to hold any type of value. Because once again, I do think that probably they haven't found the target market they're looking for. And I don't know how many people outside of uh, you know Europe are really going to feel some kind of deep rooted connection with that British history and be willing to, you know, somehow tying in the, the, the aeronautical and the airplanes thing. And the, I don't know. What do you guys think about Braemont? Do any of you out there own Braemont? Do you love the watches? Maybe they're not for you. Maybe they are. Do you, has anyone out there really feel the connection? If they're watching this video, I'd love uh, the people at Braemont to get an opportunity to see what the watch collectors and hear what the watch collectors are really saying about the brand. Um, because unfortunately they are not selling, uh, at least at the level that I'm at in the secondhand market, seeing what watches move, they don't move very quickly, uh, even at a discount, but still good watches on par with everything else in the price segment at the end of the day. Comments below, love to see it and hear it. Now, next we have Corum. Now, Corum has gone through some different changes in ownership. They are owned by a, a private, private equity or investment company uh, at this point out of Asia but they still produce Swiss watches. Of course, it's just a change in hands of who owns the equity in the company. Um, and Corum has offered, you know, watches that just for the most part go overlooked, right? They have the Corum bubble, which has become iconic in its own regard, that kind of artistic uh, avant-garde novel, kind of fun, playful bubble looking sapphire crystal. And sometimes the watches have a little bit of a um, piece of art, I guess you would call it, or a miniature sculpture under the dial, which gives a lot of depth and perspective. We currently have, I believe, the Buccaneer or the Jolly Roger. There's like a pirate theme one. They also have like um, different bats and things for the holidays. And I think there's a Christmas one and they've partnered with different popular artists. Um, I believe there's a Mona, Mona Lisa. Of course, they did not uh, technically partner if you want to think about it in that way, but they do have these interesting um, artistic pieces, if, if you will. Uh, and of course, Corum is known for the golden bridge, the very interesting bridge design and the movement design that make, was one of the earlier watches that really was willing to take that kind of risk. And you have the Admiral's Cup, which is kind of their polygon shaped uh, bezeled watch, their sportier watch that is uh, for really sailing, but it's more of sometimes of a dive watch, a water, a sports watch, that kind of large chunky watch that had a, a decent run in the earlier days um, where that was more important, uh, the days of Hublot, for example. But the reality is, once again, because there's so many watch brands out there and micro brands, and it's very easy comparatively to 10 years ago to start a watch brand, and it's easier to come out with new watch models from the brands that already exist. And 
gain instant feedback from the watch collectors out there with places like this where watch collectors are vocal. They'll tell the brands immediately what they think about the watches before they even produce the watches, right? Sometimes watch brands will put out an image uh, or they'll make maybe a hundred pieces of a watch, float it out there, see if the watch collectors like it. Oh, they don't like it. Okay, this is no longer production. They couldn't do that 10 years ago. Now they can. And so when you have a brand like Corum, I think today it should be easier than ever for them to at least know what's going to stick, but I don't think that they've quite yet found it in present day. I think they need to do something that is going to, uh, dare I say, re-put them on the map, but I think Corum often goes overlooked and it's a shame because they do produce pretty good watches in line with other things at their price point. But the reality is if you do buy one of these watches at retail, it doesn't matter the model. If you buy a Corum watch at retail, it's going to take a big hit in terms of the, the, value, the, the value of your watch. So try to find one gray market or pre-owned if you do like the watches uh, and you'll be more safe that way. And lastly, this is a shame because I think that Ulysse Nardin does do a great job with their watches and they've produced some watches like the Sonata and um, the Freak that are complicated and very interesting and special. And UN has really had a focus on watch collectors for a very long time, right? Sometimes we get into watch brands and they just don't care what the collectors want. But I think UN has offered things consistently to attract the attention of watch collectors. They've always had complications in their watches. They've also made that marine style. We have the marine diver and that's something the watch collectors have loved and they've always seemed to do pretty well, not trading at retail or above retail, but also always kind of seemingly doing well. It's always been a model, the, the, the marine diver, for example, it's always been a model from, from UN that has traded pre-owned very consistently um, and still had some level of desirability for those that wanted kind of a more modern, enthusiast focused dive watch or sporting watch. But UN, once again, like the other brands mentioned, have just kind of taken a position, a backseat position compared to all the other brands that are just doing so well today and building out, you know, endless amounts of new models. UN seems to be kind of trailing at the rear of the pack. And in my opinion, while they did come out with a newer diver model, a more a more classical, certainly not a classical dive watch, but a more classical, smaller dive watch compared to their, their Maxi Marine Diver, for example. We had some of these at Delray Watch and they took a very long time to move. No one was really asking them, asking about it at all. We had the watch on every platform, Chrono24, eBay, the forums, our website, and we were selling, you know, we were literally selling Quorum uh, Grand V, you know, simple dress watches before anyone had even asked for the UN dive watch. And for me, that, is evidence enough that perhaps UN is not really on the attention or on the minds of collectors. What do you think about UN? If you're a collector, you love the brand, perhaps you're opinionated on UN for some other reason. I'd love to see it and hear it in the comments below because truly UN was one of the first brands that I really did take a liking to for some of the more complicated watches that they, they were offering, you know, 10 years ago, some of the more complicated uh, watches like the Freak uh, within, modern times. I really enjoyed them. So it's unfortunate to see this, but maybe, and I'm excited to see for the future, if uh, Caring, which owns Gerard Perigo as well, takes some of the strategies that they've been so successful with, with the Laureato and applies them and imposes them on the UN brand. Perhaps they will make a comeback and I'll be very excited to see that. What do you think about all this? Leave this in the comments below. Please do not forget to check out DelrayWatch.com where maybe you can see some of these or maybe not because things move quickly. Uh, but nonetheless, check it out and you can find me on Instagram, The Real John P. Thanks, guys. You've been chatting with John P. Ciao.